mechanical ventilation is the process of using a machine to move air into the lungs with positive pressure. This is necessary when a patient is unable to adequately exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. The principles of mechanical ventilation determine how the machine is able to provide positive pressure and how it can be used to meet the specific needs of the patient. And that is the topic of this video. So if you're ready, let's get into it. So what are the principles of mechanical ventilation? Well, respiratory therapists and those who work in critical care must learn and understand the different principles. And this includes ventilation, oxygenation, lung compliance, airway resistance, dead space ventilation, and respiratory failure. Each of these principles is important in determining how much support is delivered to the patient depending on their individual needs. First, let's talk about ventilation. Ventilation is the physiological process of moving air in and out of the lungs during a breathing cycle. It is an essential component of respiration which helps ensure that oxygen-rich air enters the lungs while carbon dioxide is being removed. Carbon dioxide is the primary variable of ventilation. If too much CO2 builds up in the blood, it raises the acidity and lowers the pH, which can lead to ventilatory failure. Oxygenation is the physiological process of absorbing oxygen into the bloodstream. During inhalation, air enters the lungs and delivers oxygen molecules to the alveoli, where they diffuse across the alveolar capillary membrane and into the blood. From there, the oxygen is carried by the hemoglobin in red blood cells to tissues and organs throughout the body. Ventilation brings air into the lungs, while oxygenation ensures that the cells within the body receive adequate oxygen molecules. Now let's talk about lung compliance. Lung compliance is a measurement of the lung's ability to expand and contract. It is calculated by dividing the change in volume by the change in pressure. High lung compliance means that the lungs can expand more easily, while low lung compliance indicates lung stiffness. There are two primary types of lung compliance, static and dynamic. Static compliance is the measure of the lung's ability to expand when there is no airflow. It is determined by the amount of pressure required to inflate the lungs at a given volume. Dynamic compliance is a measure of the lung's ability to expand when airflow is present. It is determined by the amount of pressure required to produce a given flow rate. Next up is airway resistance. Airway resistance is a measurement of impedance to the movement of air through the respiratory tract during inspiration and expiration. It is determined by the pressure difference between the alveoli and the atmosphere. Factors that can affect airway resistance include retained secretions, bronchoconstriction, foreign body aspiration, an endotracheal tube, condensation in the ventilator circuit, neoplasm of the bronchial muscle structure, tumors compressing the airway, and an upper airway infection. The airway resistance is inversely proportional to the cross-sectional area of the airway. This means that a smaller airway has greater resistance than a larger airway. Dead space ventilation is defined as the volume of ventilated air that does not participate in gas exchange. Therefore, in this case, plenty of air reaches the alveoli, but there is a lack of perfusion available for gas exchange to occur. Which explains why dead space is known as wasted ventilation. There are three types of dead space anatomic, alveolar, and physiologic. Anatomic dead space is the volume of air in the conducting airways that does not participate in gas exchange. It is estimated to be approximately one milliliter per pound of ideal body weight. Alveolar dead space is the volume of air that reaches the alveoli but does not participate in gas exchange due to a lack of perfusion. This can occur due to decreased cardiac output, heart failure, blood loss, or a pulmonary embolism. Physiologic dead space is the total volume of air that does not participate in gas exchange. Therefore, it is the sum of the anatomic and alveolar dead space. Switching gears just a bit, now let's talk about respiratory failure. Respiratory failure occurs when the lungs are unable to adequately oxygenate the blood or remove carbon dioxide from the body. 
there are two primary types, ventilatory failure and oxygenation failure. Ventilatory failure is the inability of the lungs to remove carbon dioxide from the blood, which results in respiratory acidosis. Ventilatory failure is caused by the following, hypoventilation, a VQ mismatch, shunting, or a diffusion defect. Each mechanism causes an increase in the arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which ultimately leads to ventilation failure. Oxygenation failure is the inability of the lungs to adequately oxygenate the blood, which results in arterial hypoxemia. It is caused by hypoventilation, a VQ mismatch, or shunting. However, this type of oxygenation failure does not respond to supplemental oxygen therapy, which is known as refractory hypoxemia. Therefore, it must be treated with mechanical ventilation and increased levels of PEEP. But again, each of these principles are important when it comes to how much support is being delivered during mechanical ventilation, and they are ventilation, oxygenation, lung compliance, airway resistance, dead space ventilation, and respiratory failure. Respiratory therapists must learn and develop an understanding of each type in order to initiate and manage patients who are on the ventilator. Otherwise, how will they know how much support the patient needs? And how would they know what adjustments need to be made to the ventilator settings? Now let's break down a practice question on this topic. A 45-year-old male who is 6 feet tall and weighs 187 pounds is receiving volume-controlled assist-controlled ventilation following emergency thoracic surgery. His initial ventilator settings are as follows. FIL2 of 40%, mandatory rate of 14 breaths per minute, total rate of 14 breaths per minute, Idle volume of 510 milliliters, inspiratory time of 1.2 seconds, and a peak of 8. Several hours later, the high pressure alarm on the ventilator is triggered. The patient appears agitated with the following clinical signs. A heart rate of 125 beats per minute, respiratory rate of 30 breaths per minute, blood pressure of 165 over 95, and an oxygen saturation of 91%. The patient's breath sounds are clear but diminished in the lower lung fields. Taking everything into consideration, which of the following interventions would you recommend? A. Administer an antihypertensive medication. B. Increase the tidal volume to 700 milliliters. C. Change the ventilator mode to SIMV. Or D. Administer an IV sedative or analgesic. Do you know the answer? Well, let's break it down. The patient's elevated heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure, along with agitation and a triggered high pressure alarm, suggests that he is likely experiencing pain, anxiety, or discomfort. These are just a few clues that you should have noticed throughout the question. These findings are common in post-operative patients who are mechanically ventilated particularly after major procedures like thoracic surgery. Pain and agitation can increase muscle tension, resulting in high airway pressures and poor patient ventilator synchrony. The best approach in this scenario is to administer an IV sedative or analgesic. This will help alleviate the patient's pain and anxiety, which should decrease the agitation, improve ventilator synchrony, and resolve the high pressure alarms. The patient's elevated blood pressure is likely secondary to pain or agitation, not a primary hypertensive issue, which means that treating the underlying discomfort should resolve the high blood pressure. Increasing the tidal volume would raise the patient's peak inspiratory pressure, which would worsen the issue instead of solving it. And changing the ventilator mode won't address the root cause of the patient's agitation, in fact, it could increase the patient's work of breathing and exacerbate his discomfort. So the key takeaway is this. In mechanically ventilated patients, sudden agitation, tachycardia, and increased respiratory effort are often signs of pain, anxiety, or inadequate sedation, especially after surgery. 
addressing these symptoms with appropriate sedation or analgesia should always be considered before making changes to the ventilator settings. So taking everything into consideration, this means that the correct answer has to be D, administer an IV sedative or analgesic. If you want to support the channel, be sure to like and subscribe. I would greatly appreciate it. And there should be some other helpful videos popping up on your screen right about now that I think you will enjoy. And just a quick reminder, we are not doctors. This video is for informational purposes only. Thank you so much for watching. Have a blessed day. And as always, breathe easy, my friend.